Hola, ¿cómo estás? Espero que estés súper bien. This is Tamara Marie, host of the Learn Spanish Con Salsa podcast. Now, before we jump into this episode, I wanted to let you know about a special opportunity that you're definitely going to want to take advantage of, especially if your goal is to become fluent in Spanish. For a limited time only, my team is opening the doors to listeners of the podcast to take advantage of a free language coaching session. Now, in this session, it's not just we're teaching you about verbs or grammar, but we're really going to do a deep dive into what are your goals for learning Spanish, assess where you are on your journey to fluency at the moment, and help you map out a 90-day plan for how you can get to fluency. So we are going to help you take your Spanish to the next level, whether you're afraid of speaking Spanish or you just get a little bit nervous when you're talking to native speakers, or maybe you've got some of the basics down, but you really know that you struggle with getting your Spanish to flow and your listening skills aren't up to par. Whatever it is, even if it is a specific grammar issue, we will help you map out how to tackle that. And normally these sessions do cost, so we are offering a few slots for free. There are limited spaces available and they'll only be open up through the end of the month. So make sure you sign up. Go to SpanishConSalsa.com slash coach. That's SpanishConSalsa.com slash coach to book your free language coaching session where we will help you map out a 90-day plan to get to Spanish fluency. Okay, let's get started with the episode. What if I told you that Will Smith, James Brown, and the Beatles all had a part in some of Latin music's most popular hits of the last several decades? Would you be curious to know how Will Smith contributed to the lyrics of Mark Anthony's hit salsa song, Vivir Mi Vida? Or how James Brown influenced the music of Gloria Stefan and Miami Sound Machine? And did you know that the Beatles may have actually played bachata? You'll find the answers to these and more questions in the book Decoding Despacito, An Oral History of Latin Music. In this episode, I sit down with the author and vice president and Latin industry lead at Billboard, Leila Cobo. She has so much to share about how she was able to get some of Latin music's most popular artists to share their stories with her for her book. We have so much to talk about in this episode. I know you will enjoy our conversation. Así que vamos a empezar. Let's get started. Bienvenidos. Welcome to the Learn Spanish con Salsa podcast, the show for Spanish learners that love music, travel, and culture. Close your grammar textbooks, shut down the language apps, and open your ears to how Spanish is spoken in the real world. Let us show you how to go from beginner to bilingual. Here is your host, certified language coach, Tamara Mari. Hola y bienvenidos al episodio 121. Welcome to episode 121 of the Learn Spanish Con Salsa podcast. I'm super excited to share my conversation with the author of the book, Decoding Despacito, an oral history of Latin music. Leila Cobo shares a behind the scenes look at some of the biggest Latin hits of the past 50 years. In the book, she shares never before heard details of how the most influential songs in Latin music were conceived, told by the artists, executives, and producers who created them. In our conversation, Leila shares her favorite stories from the book and even tells us why one of my favorite songs by Romeo Santos and a few other artists were not included in her final cut. This episode is in both English and Spanish, So if you'd like to get the transcript, make sure you sign up to be a show supporter at LearnSpanishConSalsa.com slash support. Make sure you stick around to the end of this episode to find out how you can get access to our Spotify playlist of all of the songs that are covered in Leila's book. Here's my conversation with Leila Cobo. Hola, Leila. Gracias por estar aquí. Thank you so much for joining me on the Learn Spanish Con Salsa podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm very excited. I love your concept. Yes, and I have to tell you, I actually found out about your book from one of the members of my community because they just found it and they said, you have to get this book. And I went to check it out and I was like, oh, I was not disappointed. (laughs) When I saw the title, I was intrigued. 
And for me, since music is one of the things that really helps me learn Spanish and get immersed in the culture and begin to travel and dance, it was really interesting for me to hear some of the stories behind some of my favorite songs. And I actually have my copy right here. No, I have it okay. in español. And I have it in, in inglés. <laughs> and tell us a little bit about that. Why was it important for you to publish the book in both Spanish and English? Because we wanted, and I say we because it was not just me. It was my publisher too and, and my agent who was very integral in getting the book done. But it was always about taking the music not just to the Latin fans, but beyond. It was, it, we wanted... Everybody who could be a casual fan of Latin music or maybe not even a fan of Latin music to be intrigued and to then read it and say, oh, my God, I didn't know this. I didn't know this was part of like us, so to speak. So it, it was very important that the book be accessible to everybody, not just the Latin fans. Yeah, we were talking a little bit before we started recording here that you actually have an audio book, too, in Spanish and English. And I think that is a great tool for learning. So it's actually something I recommend that if you're trying to really improve your listening comprehension, your vocabulary, having that audio book and then having, you know, like the hard copy and sort of reading along while you listen is perfect. So I love that you did that and that you also narrated your audio books as well. So I think that's going to be great for those that are learning Spanish as well. Yeah, I not, I had never done that. I'd never narrated a book. And when they asked me to do it, I said, sure. I And then once you go to do it, well, first of all, I didn't realize that it takes three to four days to read one of these things. Wow. Because your voice <laughs> gives out, among other things, and your energy flags. So I had thought, oh, okay, I'll just sit down and read it in one take. And they're like... <laughs> When I first got the schedule that was okay from nine to five, I said, great. And then when do we do the second book? And they're like, no, no, that's day one of the first. <laughs> so it was a challenge. And one of the things you learn by doing that is that a lot of words that you often use and you write, you don't know how to pronounce. Or at least in my case, since I'm not a native English speaker, I didn't. So it, it was really very interesting. And you sit down with the, with the director and because it was COVID, she was somewhere else. Um, but she would stop me and she would say, no. Uh, and then she would uh, correct my pronunciation. It, it was very fascinating to do it. So, so hopefully people who are learning either language actually could benefit from it. Yeah, I think that's such a great value uh, to provide that with the book. I always love to get the audio book because I'm always on the run and I like listening to podcasts. I have a podcast, so I love audio as well. So that really um, helps me as well, because I think when we're reading in another language, like you mentioned, there were some words in English you didn't know how to pronounce. Well, I'm sure it's the same thing for people who are learning Spanish, right? They're reading the hard copy or they think they know how to pronounce it. But when they hear you say it, they go, oh, <laughs> that's not how, it, how it's really pronounced. So I think that's just a a really great addition to the book itself, besides all the amazing stories, which I want to get into. So can you talk a little bit about how you chose the songs for this book? Because I know that you you are talking a lot about those songs that really crossed over and became huge hits and put, really put Latin music on the map in different periods of time. So how did you come up with the, with the songs uh, for the book? I wanted songs that had really moved the needle. And, uh, and I didn't want to go, I, I went back 50 years, which is a lot. But when we first started to, to build the book, it, we, we discussed going back even further, you know, like, like the Perez Prado songs or old boleros. And I didn't want to do that because I wanted people, the book is an oral history. So it's narrated. I have a, an, for those who haven't read it, it's an introduction. Each chapter has an introduction to the song that explains the importance of the song in kind of popular culture. But then the narration is done by the players of each song. And I mean, the artist, the composer, the producer, people. And it ranges from like some chapters have two people, some chapters have eight people. It, it really runs the gamut. But it's in their, it's their narrative. So, so it's all these different voices telling the story. And I wanted it, I wanted them to be alive. I didn't want a third person narration. The, the only 
chapter where I did that was with Selena with Amor Prohibido because obviously she she was killed when she was only 23 years old. So, but otherwise everybody else it's in their voice. So that that set the time frame. And from there on, first we had like the massive songs, you know, Macarena, Live in la Vida Loca, Enrique Iglesias Bailando, Despacito, of course. And then we started to look at those songs that I felt very strongly had really kind of marked a before and after. Like without this song, we wouldn't have had this. Or this song created this. And that's how I started to build the book. Some of the songs are in English, you know, like Julio Iglesias to all the girls I've loved before, which is a chapter I love. There's three of those. There's Conga also by Miami Sound Machine and Gloria Stefan. And then Smooth by Santana. And those three songs were all really groundbreaking in their own way, either by chart position or uh, Smooth won all the Grammys at the, at the Grammy Awards that year. So each one has their little story. Yeah, and I, I love that how you set it up. Like, um, it's almost like you go into this journey with each story and really learn what went into the song, how the artist came up with it, from the composers, how they came with the melody. It really is fascinating to hear that process of all that it takes to put together, you know, like a three minute, you know, to five minute song, depending on the genre. So it really is fascinating. I love how you break it down and then have it told in the voices of those artists and musicians. So we really get a sense of what they were feeling behind the songs and if it really matches up with, you know, how the music makes us feel because we all have our own sort of personal emotional connection when we hear this music and it becomes a part of our lives. So I found that really, really fascinating. I do want to ask you though, since you know so many people in the industry and I'm pretty sure someone called you and said, Leila, why didn't you include my song in your book? Did you have anybody that felt like they were left out or were there songs that maybe you thought about putting in, but maybe you kind of changed your mind about later? They haven't called me, but they've told me when I see them, they're like, oh, and why isn't my song here? And, uh, and I feel terrible about that. I have to say, because I, I feel guilty because the people that have asked me, like their songs in a way should be there. But it reached a point where I had to cut the songs. You know, I had to say, okay, no more songs, no more songs. This is it. And so we really went to the essentials. We did. Like there isn't a song by Mana, who I love. There isn't a song by Juanes. There isn't a song by, well, some of the new artists, I, do, I don't have their songs because I, I had made the cutting point was 2017 with Mi Gente. That was it. And then at the very end, we added Rosalia's Malamente. But like, I don't have Osuna, who's a big favorite of mine, or Bad Bunny. So if I were to Maluma, do a part two... Romeo they, Santos. Or Maluma. <laughs> well, Romeo Santos, I wanted to put, and he wasn't available for the interview. So I said, well, fine, then no. And he is his own composer. So if I didn't have him, I had a problem. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you didn't have a story, right? <laughs> yeah, but um, I mean, they had a point. I, I had more songs. I originally had a list of like 40 songs. And then we at one point decided 20 songs. It's gonna, going to be 20 and that's it. And that stops. And so I really, I had to be very draconian with it. Uh, so I had to choose, okay, this one or this one. And it's not a reflection on the song, so... It, it's not that. It's not. It's because some songs were not huge, like Los Tigres del Norte, Contrabando y Traición. That wasn't a huge song, but I left it because I felt it was a song that really opened the door to all the narcocorrido genre as a musical genre and as a TV genre and as a film genre. So I think that song had a lot to do. So there were different reasons for including the songs that might not seem obvious but that go beyond just popularity. Okay, that's good to know because it's not just like, oh, all the songs that hit number one for like 10 weeks or something like the Billboard criteria. You actually were very intentional about the songs that you chose to put in the book. Yes. And for example, El Gran Barón by Willie Colon, that song wasn't Willie's biggest hit ever, but I thought it was so important that that song talks about being gay from a male point of view at a time when no one was talking about that. I mean, that that was a topic that wasn't being touched with a 10-foot pole. And for Omar Alfano, who's a fabulous songwriter, to write the song and then 
for Willy Colon, who is, you know, he plays the trombone. I, I can't imagine anybody more macho sounding and looking at Willy Colon to record it, I think was a huge statement and very eye-opening. Kind of like, oh, wow, you can really say anything you want in a song. But the song is good. That was one of the songs that surprised me the most, one of the stories, because I have to tell you, so I, when I first heard the song, it wasn't when it first came out. So I wasn't aware of like all the controversy about it. So I found out about it when I started dancing salsa and it was one of the songs I know I've danced to before. And I was like, wait, is that what the song is about? I never really looked into it. And to hear that story and the rich history and how it brought AIDS to the forefront and gay issues, like, there was so much to that, that it made me go back and reevaluate and, and really look into it um, after I heard sort of the artist tell the story and the composer and the fact that there was a real guy, right? Like this yes. may have been based on, but we don't know the identity of this person. It's so uh, interesting. So I felt like, you know, I'm always telling people, you know, you've got to know the music and a lot of people who dance salsa don't speak Spanish. Spanish, right? Some of them just like connect with the rhythm and they sort of get the feeling, but they don't know what the song is about. And I'm always telling people, you've got to learn like the song that's it's not in your book, but it's a uh, rebellion by Joe Arroyo. Yes. It's like one of the songs that when I first found out the lyrics, I was like, what? This is about a slave rebellion in Cartagena, Colombia. And like, and it's a dance song. It's not like this it's song you sit song. and think about it. So, um, so it was just funny to me that I, there was a song that missed my radar. I was like, wow, this is so fascinating that there was so much controversy about that topic when it first came out. So uh, I really did appreciate that one. But I, I want to ask you, though, since you've sort of been in this for a while, and you, you know these artists, you've been around the music. Was there any story in particular that surprised you that you weren't expecting to hear or something that you thought was a little bit interesting behind one of these songs that you picked? Well, they all had something that I hadn't heard. The story I knew best was Despacito because it had just happened and I had reported it kind of to death. But aside from that, I had never sat down with them to talk so specifically about a song. Uh, so there was something in every story that was very surprising that I had no idea. Like in Conga. Conga is, is a cool example because it's a song that's so well known. I've interviewed Gloria so many times, but this was the first time I really sat down with her to talk just about this very specific song. And she went into great detail about how they recorded it, how they recorded the effects of the song, how they recorded the percussion. They sampled James Brown. They sampled James Brown. Like that blew my mind. Yes, And mine all too. These years, <laughs> yeah, right? Like all these years of hearing that song, I had no idea. I was like, really? Really? Like I went back and I'm like, oh my God, they do. Like I, th I didn't know this. Smooth, even Smooth, which I had also done an oral history of Smooth for Billboard when I spoke with Etel Shure, who co-wrote the song with Rob Thomas. And he told me that song originally was about like two people meeting in a, you know, like little uh, clandestine meeting in a motel. And they changed that whole story and made it. It's kind of like the basic structure, but they ch entirely changed the lyrics and how Rob Thomas came in and wrote these songs about his Spanish Harlem Mona Lisa, who was his girlfriend at the time, you know, who was half Puerto Rican, I think. Each story had a little nugget of information that was that was really, really lovely. I, I mean, uh, Julio Iglesias talking about how he flew to to Texas to record with Willie Nelson. He had never met Willie Nelson. And like he sees this country guy with the braids and he was like, this is the guy, <laughs> like, who are you? And he didn't, he said he didn't speak English either, right? He didn't speak any English, his <laughs> English sucked. Uh, they, they, all, they all had something really kind of beautiful. Um, Selena's dad talking about how the story that was the inspiration for the song was actually the, the real story of his grandmother and, and her ill-fated love. Uh, so they, they all had like a little bit of, of uh, cool background in them of, of how they came to be. And they get very specific, as you saw. They, they really, really do. Uh, in Shakira and Whenever, Wherever, There's, there's a part that I just love because I can just see this in my head that uh, Tommy Motola says that she walked into his office carrying a, one of those legal yellow pads and he says she would sit down and give notes and take notes. I've never like had an artist like that and I can just see Shakira doing that. Uh, <laughs> so like every, every story had something 
they got very personal in them. Was it hard to get any of them to open up about the songs or were any of their memories a little sketchy? Because I know some of the songs are maybe from 20 or 30 years ago. Or was it quite easy? Were they willing to sort of tell these stories and share this information? They were willing to tell them, but they had to be prompted because a lot of them had forgotten. And when I started, started speaking with Shakira, I said, OK, so tell me how you wrote the song. And so she told me like in a minute. And then I said, OK, now let's go back. Like, where were you exactly? Where was the studio? What were you talking about? And she kept saying, which is what a lot of them kept saying. Oh, my God, it was so long ago. But I remember, I remember they remembered. I don't think they had thought about these things in a long time. But then they remember and they get excited talking about it. It's their song. Yeah. And it's interesting to me, too, how some of the songs that became really popular weren't necessarily the best songs. Like, I love the story about Macarena and how they're like, this is ridiculous. They're like, and if it wasn't for the dance, that that song probably really wouldn't have worked. Right. That was like such an interesting story to me, too, to hear about that whole that whole thing, because the lyrics of the song are pretty basic. It's not like this is a classic, right? Like you're not going to pull this up on like your top 40 songs of all time. But it worked right because of this this dance that they came up with and it became this international hit. <laughs> I, I love that story, too. And, and all the layers of that story, because first it's them, Los del Rio, talking how they wrote this song you know, in a party in Caracas, and it was kind of just for fun, and hey, Macarena, you know, not thinking much. And, and it kind of becomes a little hit in Spain. And then they remix it, and then they remix it again with the Bayside Boys here in Miami. And and Carlos Diarza saying how every week they would get a call from the promoter, and the promoter would be, oh, the song is now in the top 100. Oh, now it's in the top 50. And Carlos Diarza, who had written the remix kept saying I can't believe it this silly song like how is this even happening yeah that was, that was one, of, one of my favorite stories too but there's so many uh, good stories in the book and I really love the description of Latin music as arroz y frijoles con hamburguesa I love that because it's like this mix of culture I see Emilio Stefan Yes, yes. Is it fair to say that most of the songs that became really big hits were really like a fusion of different genres, like mixing modern with classic instead of the more traditional Latin songs that maybe, you know, somebody who really loves Latin music, that would be their favorites. But these songs that really crossed over were most of them like a fusion between uh, sort of like American culture and Latin culture. I think all of them were a fusion in some way. And I think that's part of the beauty of the book and the beauty of the songs. And I didn't realize that when I went in, I didn't choose the songs like that. I chose just, you know, the songs I thought were the best, the most influential, the most impactful. And then in telling the stories, I realized how much fusion there was in each of them. And I love that you picked up on that because that's been a sticking point with me, especially as I was writing the book and, uh, and so many people post it on Twitter, which is like, like, I don't even know what the objective is, but they always post like, oh no, so this person is in Latin, like shame on them. Or this person is Spanish, or this person doesn't do this, or this is the wrong genre. And no one was thinking this when they did these songs. Like Shakira wasn't thinking, oh, Tim Mitchell is from Detroit, so I shouldn't record with him. Like, no. She was thinking, this is my writing partner who I write great songs with, so let's work together. Uh, Gloria and Emilia were doing, I mean, that was like a whole mishmash of cultures, what they were doing. Even Enrique Iglesias was doing like his pop in Miami. Then it connected with Gente de Zona in Cuba. Every song is like a huge fusion, a huge fusion. It's like the best of everything. Yeah, I think that's part of what makes makes them successful because I do, I, you know, you talked about the Twitter uh, sort of audience out there. And I think it's really interesting that people who really love music tend to get very dogmatic about it. I think they're very much like, no, this is what true bachata or true salsa or whatever. And and don't like some of that. They consider crossover almost bad. I mean, like I relate to that because I like grew up as a hip hop head. Right. And I was like, oh, I love hip hop. And then when it started like crossing over, I kind of had this tension, too, where I felt like, oh, is that real hip hop? Like, it's so popular. Like it's my music. Yeah. <laughs> like it was my personal thing. And then it became, then there's like Eminem. And I'm like, I like this, but this is weird. Like this guy from Detroit, he's not from the Bronx. Like, what is this? So I think it is interesting that that tension is there, but also 
how some of that fusion is what makes it relatable. Like you talked about Selena's story and how she was born in the U.S., but she had this sort of bicultural, bilingual style that people could relate to that were also born in the U.S., that were Latino or second, third generation who hadn't had that connection before. So I, I think that's an interesting part of sort of all of the stories and all of the songs, how it just happens to be when the artists are experimenting and pushing those styles and really trying to mix things up, that that's when they come upon something really great. So I think that is a, a huge part of it. And I, I want to ask you a question because you are a music expert and I have to ask you this because this is Learn Spanish con Salsa. There's a lot of controversy about where does salsa come from, right? Like, is it from Puerto Rico? Is it from Colombia? Is it from Cuba? I always say it was from Nueva York, right? Like, it's that's where it's, it's a mix of, of different Latin music. I always say that. Yeah. So what would you, what's the story behind, like, the genre? And, it, you know, because salsa itself is sort of an invention. It's not like this thing that exists, uh, you know, like it has its roots in any one country. No, it has all these rhythms. I mean, from Cuba predominantly, but also from Puerto Rico. And then it really came together, or at least this is the accepted narrative. And it's a narrative that I've used myself. In fact, Johnny Pacheco died a couple of months ago. And uh, and I wrote the obit for Billboard. And in the obit, I said he was the, the person who, one of the people who originally coined the term salsa to refer to that music that was a mixture of Puerto Rican beats and Cuban beats, but also kind of like the jazz beats, uh, you know, the trumpets, the brass from New York City. And then you have this big mix. And if you listen to Colombian salsa, it's different from Cuban salsa. It's different from Puerto Rican salsa. Each country kind of like puts its, uh, its little bit of the rhythm. But I always say that it came together in New York. And I think that's pretty accepted. I mean, in Cuba, they were doing son, obviously. And, and I think we can obviously agree that if there had been no son cubano, there would be no salsa as we know it. That's what I think. But I think the sounds are completely different. The book has a chapter on Carlos Vives, right, who is known for his vallenato, which is not purist vallenato. And that chapter, which is La Tierra del Olvido, which I put in there, not his biggest hit, but it is, I had called them actually about another song, you know, because I wanted to include him because I thought like he opened up vallenato to the world. And then he said, no, you should do La Tierra del Olvido because this song really was the blueprint for what came afterwards. And it was great because even though it was all Colombian musicians, he wasn't doing an international fusion. Everybody in that song talks about their style of music. So Maite says, oh, you know, I came from the coast and I brought that sensibility. Then Egidio had the accordion and he was that sensibility. And then the music director was this guy from Bogota that did rock. And they put all of that together and that's what came out. So even then you have a fusion. Right. And I think it also speaks to just how the Spanish language itself is different in each country, right? Because people say, oh, Spanish is Spanish. And I say, yeah, but if you go to Colombia and then you go to Cuba or you go to the Dominican Republic, it's like, whoa, is this the same language? So I think that the cultural part is so important to understand, you know, not just about the artists and the people behind it, but also sort of those those differences that really give the flavor uh, to the music. And you know what? There's one last thing with the book. There is one song, Shakira's Whenever, Wherever, and that song was translated by Gloria Stefan. And it's a great wow. translation. It's a really, really great translation. And uh, so if any of you guys are fans of Shakira and that song, I suggest you put the two versions side by side because it's one of, I think it's one of the best translations I've ever seen of a song where you know you have to adapt the words so they fit the music in the other language so it can never be exact but it works really well so i think that's a good little teaching tool there too and it's fun okay how did she say funny lucky how my breasts are small and humble in spanish and she makes it work yeah translation is an art and i think people assume just because you know someone speaks two languages that they can be like a translator or an interpreter you know how people say like oh well you know, I know that you speak English, you speak French, you speak Spanish. Like, can you translate this for me? And they're always surprised when a person says, well, no, I can't. Because it's not always that easy just because you you have like these two different tracks. And there's words that you know in Spanish or English or another language. But when someone asks you to sort of connect those dots, 
it's like, uh, wait, hold on. I should know this, but for some reason, those connections aren't there, right? So I, I yeah. think um, translation is an art. I think people take for granted or just assume that everyone can do. Absolutely. I totally agree. I hope everyone gets the book. But before I let you go, quiero saber un poquito de ti. Quiero preguntarles un poquito en español uh, porque ese es un podcast para estudiantes de español. Y quiero saber un poquito de la historia de la mujer tras el libro. Entonces, Leila, cuéntanos un poquito de ti, de dónde eres y aparte de ser un autor, ¿a qué te dedicas? Bueno, yo te quiero preguntar a ti dónde aprendiste español. En, en Estados Unidos, eh, <ríe> hablando, hablando por internet, con la música, principalmente con la música latina, cantando, no, no puedo cantar la verdad, pero <ríe> en, en la ducha sí, en la ducha sí, canto, escucho la música, también bailo salsa, entonces sí. Porque hablas muy bien, estoy muy impresionada, muy buen acento. Gracias. <ríe> Pero yo soy colombiana donde se habla el mejor español del mundo, o por lo menos eso dice. He oído eso. Y soy de Cali, que es la capital de la salsa. ¡Wow! Cómo me eché de flores hoy. Pero sí, soy, soy colombiana, soy de Cali, toco piano, soy de una familia muy musical, pero también somos muy amantes de la salsa y de la música cubana en mi casa. Estudié música y trabajo en Billboard hace 20 años cubriendo la música latina. Entonces, siempre he querido mezclar de alguna manera la música con el periodismo, que son mis dos grandes pasiones. Y he escrito... Este es el tercer libro... De, ¿El tercer? Sí. Este es el tercer libro de música que escribo. Pero es el más lindo. Tengo un libro que es como una guía para la gente que quiere ser artista. Después hice... Fui ghostwriter de un memoir con Etnita Nazario que se llama Vida y este es mi tercer libro de música. También tengo dos novelas que son muy musicales, pero, pero este es mi tercer libro y, y cubro, manejo todo lo que es la música latina para Billboard. Entonces todo el día estoy rodeada de música y rodeada de letras y canciones y eso es lo que me apasiona. Sí, es como un sueño para mí, creo. <risas> Eso es lo que te... Y ¿sabes qué? Ah, quiero volver al libro porque para tus estudiantes hay un capítulo que... Bueno, todos los capítulos me sorprendieron, pero el de Juan Luis Guerra, de Burbujas de Amor, yo no sé si ustedes saben que él se inspiró en, las, en los poemas de Neruda para hacer la letra de esa canción, cosa que yo no sabía. Pero tampoco me sorprendió, ¿no? Porque así es Juan Luis. Pero es bonito porque hay referencias muy directas en la canción a obras de Neruda. Entonces es una canción linda para descubrir como little nuggets, like, ah, esto es de tal poema. La sorpresa para mí de esa historia fue la influencia de los Beatles, porque él dice que a los Beatles tocan bachata. Para mí fue como, ¿qué? Y fuiste a oír la canción, ¿verdad? It's still there was you. It's, it's a cover. Y si, él apenas me contó, colgué el teléfono porque hicimos la entrevista por teléfono y fui y busqué la canción y dije, ajá, tienes razón. Eso fue gracioso para mí. Sí. Entonces, ¿cómo fue el proceso que tú aprendiste inglés? Porque eres de Colombia, entonces aprendiste en la escuela cuando era niña o después como adulto. Aprendí en la escuela de niña. Fui a un colegio americano en Cali y todas las clases eran en inglés, excepto la clase de español. Entonces era, sí, era, it was the American school. Eh, entonces todos aprendimos inglés y todos hablábamos inglés y todos somos muy americanizados a pesar de ser muy colombianos. Sí, entonces eh, una mezcla de culturas de toda tu vida, ¿no? Sí, sí, y me encanta y, y crecí oyendo mucha música, obviamente en español, porque, pues, porque vivo, vivía en Colombia, pero también mucha música en inglés. Entonces, eh, como Juan Luis, muy amante de los Beatles, y estaba pensando ahora mientras hablábamos que cuando yo era chiquita y todavía no había internet, ni lyrics online, ni nada de esas cosas, y a nosotros en Colombia nos llegaban los discos, los vinyls, nos llegaban la versión colombiana, o sea, no llegaban con la letra ni nada. 
Entonces uno se sentaba y creo que todos en Latinoamérica hemos tenido esta experiencia, que poníamos la música y nos sentábamos a tratar de descifrar qué era lo que estaban diciendo. Entonces uno se sentaba a oír las canciones y las escribía y las escribía y las escribía. Y muchos años después, ya de grande, oigo las canciones, ya tengo las letras enfrente y digo, oh my God, I learned the wrong lyrics. Like, this is <laughs> not what they're saying at all. <laughs> Hay un meme así con un gato diciendo que cuando descubrí que, ay, esa es, es la letra de verdad de, de esa canción, es una sorpresa porque estamos escuchando, pero no sabemos el idioma, entonces estamos cantando lo que, lo que escuchamos, ¿no? Pero a veces no es, no es, uh, no es correcto, pero también uh, eso me pasa en inglés <ríe> con algunas canciones como Michael Jackson, es como, ¿qué está diciendo? ¿no? <ríe> y después uno oye y dice, ah, I get it. Uh -huh. <ríe> hay hay, hay muchas muchos anécdotas así de uno cuando se da cuenta lo que de verdad están diciendo. Pero digo, it works both ways, ¿no? Y yo sé que esta es una pregunta bien difícil de responder, pero voy a preguntarte de todas formas. ¿Tienes una canción favorita? ¿Del libro? No, en, en tu vida de, de todo, no necesariamente en el libro. Ay, en mi vida de todo. Ay, tengo muchas canciones favoritas. Tengo, a ver, las canciones que tengo en mi, en mi playlist ahora. Tengo un playlist que se llama... Just Listen, y ahí pongo como que las canciones que me, que me encantan, y obviamente tengo canciones de mi esposo que se llama Arthur Hanlon y es pianista, entonces ahora tiene un, ah, ahora tiene Hallelujah con Evaluna Montaner y esa está muy linda, that's a great song. Tengo Sunday Candy, ¿has oído esa canción? No, no, <laughs> nunca. It's a great song. Tengo, ah, tengo la música de... Tengo Cali Pachanguero del Grupo Nietzsche. Ah, sí, es un clásico. Que no está en el libro, pero es de mis canciones favoritas. Tengo She Used to Love Me a Lot de Johnny Cash. So there's no rhyme or reason, really. Sí. Tengo... Es una mezcla de todo. Tengo Summertime en la versión de Louis Armstrong y Ella Fitzgerald. And then I have Before He Cheats by Carrie Underwood. So what can I tell you? There's no... <laughs> You listen to a little, little bit of everything. Yeah. <laughs> ¿Y cuándo te mudaste a, a Estados Unidos de, de Colombia? Me mudé cuando tenía 19 años para ir a la universidad, para ir a Manhattan School of Music en New York. Entonces, ¿fue difícil para ti hablar inglés con personas de Nueva York? Porque yo sé que ellos tienen un acento distinto, ¿no? Y también cuando estás aprendiendo un idioma, no necesariamente hablas el idioma. Entonces, ¿fue, fue difícil para ti al principio mudarse a, a, Nueva, a Nueva York para hablar con la gente allí? ¿Que fue diferente de aprendiendo el idioma en Colombia? No, fíjate que no. Porque como en el colegio era un colegio americano y los profesores casi todos eran de Estados Unidos, entonces el oído lo tenía muy acostumbrado. Lo que siempre me cuesta trabajo es cuando hablo con gente inglesa o de Escocia o de Irlanda. Eh, yo siempre digo que cuando, voy a, cuando me siento a ver una película, especialmente una película escocesa o irlandesa, me toma como 20 minutos empezar a entender lo que están diciendo. Pero no, en, esta, en Nueva York no, no, la verdad que no. Además, ir a Nueva York era como que el sueño de mi vida. So I was like so excited to be there que no importaba en qué me hablaran, I was going to make that work. Sí, sí, entiendo, entiendo. Entonces, ¿tienes algún truco o consejo que puedes darles a los estudiantes de español que están pensando que ya, yo nunca voy a llegar a la fluidez? ¿Tienes algún algún tip o algo así para, para ellos? Yo creo que, bueno, primero lo tienen que hablar. Es la única manera, porque solamente oyendo no vas a, no vas a aprender nunca. Por más que entiendas, una cosa es entender, otra cosa es hablar, ¿no? Pero creo que hoy en día teniendo eh, tantos streaming services, teniendo Netflix y Amazon que tienen tantas películas que son en, en otros idiomas y que son en español y que son buenas, porque hay unas series en español que son maravillosas. Yo creo que eso es lo mejor que puede haber pasado. Yo siempre veo las series en el idioma original, 
Entonces, creo que eso sí es un gran aid. Ver las series, tener los captions para poder seguir. Yo así practicaría. Eso es lo que estoy haciendo yo, por lo menos con el francés, que lo hablo muy mal. Pero así estoy tratando de mejorarlo. Sí, sí. Ah, entonces estás aprendiendo francés también. Sí, pero ¿sabes qué? Yo creo que tus consejos deben ser mejores que los míos porque tu dicción en español es muy buena. Y es difícil ah, tener la dicción gracias. en español. Es muy difícil para mí porque a veces es como la gente me dice que, ay, Tamara, tú tienes un acento caribeño o algo así, pero para mí sí. yo solo trato de hablar, ¿no? No tengo, no pienso en tener algún acento o otro, solo quiero hablar. <ríe> pero creo que es porque aprendí con la música, ¿no? <ríe> pero es una gran manera de aprender porque el español tiene las vocales más cerradas, tiene las consonantes más duras. Esa es la gran diferencia con el inglés. Tiene la R, el tre, tre, ¿no? eh, la R y la R, que son difíciles, pero, pero esas son cuestiones mecánicas, ¿sabes? Y son cuestiones que si uno las practica, practica, te acostumbras y puedes hacer el, el switch de un idioma al otro. Y para mí sí, creo que también es, es mejor si hablas, porque si solo estás escuchando, no vas a llegar a la fluidez solamente escuchando. Sí, es importante Nunca. entender, pero tienes que hablar. Entonces tienes sí. razón. Sí, y ¿sabes qué es importante? Que creo que la gente se olvida que a nosotros los latinos nos encanta cuando nos hablan en español. Ah, sí. A mí, a mí me encanta cuando me hablan en español. Y me encanta cuando estoy en un país latino y viene alguien de fuera a dar un concierto y hace el esfuerzo por hablar en español. Así sea, buenas noches, Bogotá. Entonces uno dice, ah, qué maravilla, están hablando español. Eso yo creo que para nosotros es muy gratificante, que la gente haga el intento. Así esté mal. Yo prefiero que me hablen mal, pero estén tratando a que no traten para nada. Sí, sí, yo creo que también es importante porque el idioma llega al alma, ¿no? No es como... Ay, está, tú tienes que hablar inglés, ¿no? No, no, no. Es como yo estoy en tu país y yo voy a tratar. Si no es perfecto, está bien, pero yo voy a intentar a hacerlo. Entonces, sí. Sí, y, sa y sabes, es, es para cualquier país. Yo también cuando viajo y no conozco el idioma bien, trato, lo hablo mal, pero por lo menos mi italiano, que es mi idioma soñado, lo hablo pésimamente mal, pero ahí como que lo, lo chapoteo mal hablado y prefiero eso a, a no hacer el intento. Sí, sí, yo creo que eso es importante también. Entonces, gracias, Leila. Thank you so much for your time today, for sharing some of these amazing stories about all of the music that we all love, right? Some stories that we probably didn't know before and that will really help us connect more with Latin music and with the artists that created all of this amazing music that we listen to. Gracias, Leila, por compartir la historia tras tu libro con nosotros hoy. Gracias, gracias a ti en español, la fórmula despacito, en inglés, decoding despacito, pero get the audiobook porque así lo pueden oír. Yes, definitely get the audiobook. I definitely recommend that. I have it and I love it and I've loved listening to you tell these all these stories as well. So, gracias por todo. Thank you so, so much. This, this has been a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Leila Cobo. If you want to get a copy of her book, Decoding Despacito, go to learnspanishconsalsa.com slash decoding despacito. The book is available in both English and Spanish, and the audiobooks are also available, which is really great if you want to improve your listening comprehension and vocabulary, all while you're learning about the stories behind some of the most popular Latin songs from the past several decades. And of course, as the book title suggests, the story behind the song Despacito is also in the book, among many, many others. I know you will love this book. I have found it to be so interesting to find out the stories behind some of my favorite, favorite songs. And it really just is really insightful. And you really get to connect more with the artist and learn more about how they came up with some of this music that we all love so much. So if you use the link in our show notes page, you'll be able to download the audiobook for free 
from Audible Latino. So make sure you go to LearnSpanishConSalsa.com slash Decoding Despacito to download your free audiobook from Audible. We'll also have a link to our Spotify playlist of all the songs featured in the book. So if you want to get access to the playlist, once again, go to our show notes page, LearnSpanishConSalsa.com slash Decoding Despacito, and you'll be able to download our playlist. And you'll also hear that Beatles song that Juan Luis Guerra said sounds a lot like bachata. As always, I hope that something you heard today has helped you go un pasito más cerca, one step closer from Spanish beginner to bilingual. Hasta la próxima. Thank you for listening to the Learn Spanish con Salsa podcast at LearnSpanishConSalsa.com. 